All right. Well, first off, I want to say thank you, everyone, for joining us today for this event. Um, my name is Thomas Hale, and I am a second year security policy study student at the Elliott School of International Affairs, focusing on the national security implications of critical mineral supply chains. I'm also a student at the University of Delaware and their Minerals, Materials, and Society Certificate Program. I'll be the moderator for our first session today on Environmental Security and Thought Leadership Networking series. This is a four-part series developed by the Security Policy Studies Student Board, focusing on critical environmental and energy topics in the field of national security. Today's session is focused on critical mineral supply chains and U.S. national security. Our series will also end with a networking event later this year where you can meet with our speakers and learn more about their research and organizations. So please stay tuned and join us for the following sessions. These sessions will include water security, energy and environmental issues in South Asia, and the gendered impact of climate change. I will first introduce our two distinguished panelists and then let them give their presentations. And then we're gonna open it up for a discussion in chat. So at the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A box. So please put the, your questions there and our team will work to get them answered. Without further ado, let me introduce our two panelists and we will get right into the presentation. Our first panelist is Dr. Salim Ali. Dr. Ali is a blue and gold distinguished professorship of energy and environment at the University of Delaware, a professorial research fellow at the University of Queensland, Australia, and a senior fellow at Columbia University Center on Sustainable Investment. His research focuses on environmental security, climate diplomacy, and industrial ecology, particularly involving extractive industries. Professor Ali's fieldwork experience has spanned over 100 countries, on six continents for which he has also been named a National Geographic Explorer and a young global leader by the World Economic Forum. His book includes Treasures of the Earth, Need, Greed and Sustainable Future and Environmental Diplomacy, as well, over, as, well as over two, 120 peer reviewed journal articles. He is also a member of the United Nations International Resource Panel and the Science Panel for Global Environment Facility. The pro Professor Lee received his doctorate in environmental planning from MIT a master's degree in environmental studies from Yale University and a bachelor's degree in chemistry from Tufts University. He is also a citizen of Australia, Pakistan and United States. Our second speaker will be Dr. Julie Michelle Klinger who holds a PhD in geography from the University of California, Berkeley. She is an assistant professor in the Department of Geography and Spatial Sciences at the University of Delaware and an associate director of the Minerals, Materials and Society program focusing on the dynamics of global resource frontiers and space-based technologies with particular emphasis in China, Brazil, and the United States. Dr. Klinger has conducted extensive ethnographic, qualitative, and quantitative fieldwork since 2003. She has published numerous articles on rare earth elements, natural resource use, environmental politics, and outer space. Her 2017 book, Rare Earth Frontiers from Terrestrial Subsoils to Lunar Landscapes, was awarded the Meridian Book Prize for its unusually important contribution to the art and science of geography. Dr. Klinger's global research agenda consists of three distinct yet interlinked initiatives, critical mineral supply chains, global space politics, and rural and indigenous community survival strategies. She is also the principal investigator of the United States National Science Foundation funded project, characterizing the global illicit trade in energy critical materials using machine learning, remote sensing, and qualitative research. It's an honor to have both of you with us today, and I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Lee for his first presentation on a system science approach to critical metal sourcing. Okay, greetings friends uh, at George Washington. It's great to connect with you. Thanks to Thomas, um, whom we are very pleased to have in our Minerals, Materials, and Society graduate certificate program. So um, I have abbreviated the presentation I was originally going to give because of the time dimension. Uh, we had originally said it would be titled the system science approach to planet uh, uh, critical mineral sourcing. And I'm going to focus more on the demand side of the systems approach, but we will get to systems analysis as well. And especially since this is a security audience, I think it's the, the demand supply interaction that's most uh, appropriate in this way. So first of all, with reference to mineral demand uh, and its uh, implicit assumptions, um, we have to get the issues up straight. There are three areas where we need to first 
consider these assumptions. One is that society's needs are based on population and quality of life. So we as a society have to decide what kind of demographic and quality of life indicators we are willing to have. And demand comes from that. Um, and I'm also not going to focus as much on specific projections of demand uh, that are contested. I'm going to try and present the consensus view that is out there based on the, uh, the, the latest research. There's, there's also the, the real challenge we have is there's also global environmental change which is occurring, uh, especially climate change. And we are trying to, as a society, address that through interventions. And those interventions are mostly technological interventions. We could have behavioral interventions too, but the behavioral side is more difficult because of the first point, because people do want a certain quality of life. So that in itself presents a security dilemma in terms of how much domestically a country like the United States can make changes in terms of its regulations uh, and, and making people change their lifestyles versus how technology can potentially provide win-win opportunities, at least for the consumer. There's never free lunch in the universe. There's always going to be some trade-off, but for the consumer, it may seem like a win-win if you can bring in the technology. Um, and then thirdly, there's a, there's a range of these technologies which are out there, and how do we decide based on the cost? And we have to think about the uptake of the technology. So the demand projections consider all these three assumptions. And our friends in the environmentalist community sometimes come and challenge some of those assumptions because they say, well, we can change behavior. We can consume less. We can move more to a circular economy, which ideally I agree with them on, but living in a Are we, am I still there? Yes, you're still there. Oh, okay, all right. I don't know why I'm getting a message saying that you have been signed off. <laughs> so um, so essentially, uh, with reference to the, uh, the third point with the environmentalist community, we are in this challenge that we, they're trying to get us to change the behavior, which ideally we would want to, but in a pluralistic society, in a democratic society, you there are limits to what you can impose in terms of those issues. And that's where the national security and the international security intersect, which the bright people at GW know all too well, living especially in the shadow of uh, Capitol Hill and, uh, and the White House. So here is the, a demand projection for green technologies from Bloomberg. And I'm especially happy with this projection. I'm using this because it was developed by one of our former students in Australia, Kwasi Ampofo, Dr. Kwasi Ampofo, happily a PhD now from the University of Queensland. And he's now directing the metals um, research program at Bloomberg. Uh, and they are doing some really great up-to-date work on creating these projections. So this is the one I trust the most. There are lots of them. They're all over the place projections on demand, but remember those assumptions and remember why you need to be careful about which what you read into the assumptions from different players. So here you can see, <clears throat> if you think about now the supply of what kinds of metals are needed, these are the different metals that are needed. Now, some of them like copper and aluminum, we know all too well, are sort of the old world metals, even uh, nickel to some degree, but there are others like graphite, um, which is not even a metal, it's a non-metal, <clears throat> it's a form of carbon, uh, but it's a material which is very important for batteries. And if we're going to have a green transition, whether it is to cars, electric cars, or we want to have solar and wind, we need batteries because solar and wind do not provide us base load power. So you, you have, this is the real conundrum we are in. We, the, the, the most reliable source of base load power is either fossil fuels or nuclear. Nuclear actually is a low carbon 
energy source. And if the, the total calculations are now beyond doubt, even the IPCC agrees that nuclear is actually a fairly low carbon energy source, even though a lot of carbon goes into constructing a nuclear power plant, the operation is very small amount of carbon. But because we are phasing out nuclear, that is leading us to a challenge of how are we going to get base load power so batteries can provide a mechanism for that because you can store the solar and then you find a mechanism to provide that. So batteries are not just important for the electric cars. If we want the solar wind transition, we need it too, um, especially if we're not going to go for nuclear, which is another debate. I personally think we, are, we have been led astray by the, the rapid phase out of nuclear. Uh, and we can maybe talk about that in the Q&A and the new, uh, generation of nuclear, I think, is really important. If we're serious about climate change. Remember, there's no free lunch in the universe. So if we're really serious about climate change, nuclear needs to be on the table. And the Biden administration has recognized that they have invested about $5 billion in next-gen nuclear. Um, so that's the dynamic we are in. With these metals now that we're going to be needing for the batteries, we've got cobalt, particularly manganese, uh, and lithium. And then we've got graphite also as a non-metal that's going to be very important. So rapid growth. Now you have to ask from a security perspective, where are these materials? And some years ago, uh, several of us worked on this paper, which was published in Nature, that argued for importance of international governance around mineral supply, precisely because of these security challenges that we are facing uh, in terms of global geopolitics. And the US-China deterioration of relations is very concerning. And I think uh, Julie is going to also talk more about that. So one of the things we recognized in that paper was that the ore grades are declining. So we have to think about diversifying our supply because we are get, we're generating more waste and getting less metal. And, and that's a concern. Uh, and this is true for all of these major areas. The other uh, so, so what are the options then for sources? So either we are going to get terrestrial resources with competing human uses. So that's going to lead to conflict, hence the security problem, right? There are countries which have actually got a moratorium on new mining because there's been so much conflict like El Salvador has a, a mining moratorium right now. Uh, Philippines until last year had a mining moratorium um, for new projects. So because of domestic conflicts, so it becomes a security issue for that reason. And they, they, these are very serious conflicts. You have on the one hand, indigenous people being targeted. You have environmentalists being targeted because of the conflict. We have had the worst year for environmental murders in the last year because of these kinds of conflicts, many associated with, um, with mining projects. And then you also get civil strife uh, more generally on the streets and cities like we had in um, in Chile in some cases, which some of it was fueled by inequality that was caused by massive uh, income uh, differences that is a structural problem with many mineral economies. So um, you have that problem or you have terrestrial mining which can compromise biodiversity, which is not competing with human land uses, but it's going into vulnerable ecosystems like rainforests. So what are the other options? We have coastal mining where you go into the water and we do that. We're doing that with wind farms. We're like, there's too much conflict with wind farms on land. Let's go into the water, right? There are plenty of conflicts with wind farms on land. So they're taking them into the water. The mining could happen the same way, but that's the coastal side or you can go into the deep ocean. And that presents another interesting security solution potentially, but also some challenges. And then finally, the win-win, which our environmentalist friends always want us to get at is recycling. But there are limits to what we can recycle because the demand is going to be, that demand curve I showed you is far more than what recycling can provide. Because for recycling, you first need the stock. We don't have enough stock before we can recycle for some of these new metals that will be used for the uh, green energy technology. But that should be our goal. But we're not there yet. We need to get to the stocks. The other problem is that the market is not aligned to invest in the kinds of metals that we want. The market signals in terms of short-term profitability favor metals like gold, which is not needed for green technologies. Gold 90% is used in jewelry. So 
But if you go to mining exploration conferences, uh, you will find vast majority are gold mining exploration. And so the market, it's a market failure in that way. There's a huge delay between the market signal saying we need cobalt, we need this, and mining investors getting into cobalt business and developing a mine which can take 10 to 15 years. So let's take the case of cobalt, which is on everyone's mind because it's been discussed a lot with 60% or so comes from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the DRC. So as we all know, and this is a country with many security challenges. I've had the good fortune of visiting DRC. It's a wonderful country in many ways, but it does have security challenges. And it's a, a country which is very difficult to govern because of the geography of the country. Um, so what do we do? We want to make sure that some minerals lead to poverty alleviation in DRC and revenues get to the people, but uh, without good governance, we're in a dilemma. And then you have these other places which are trying to increase their supply as well, but there's still a small percentage compared to DRC. So we have to think about diversifying supply. So this is one area I have become very involved in, just like Julie is working in outer space, I'm working a lot in inner space with reference to the oceans and looking into um, what is possible with the deep sea. And especially like with tellurium is an interesting one. This is one of the world's largest reserves of tellurium that is off the coast of the Canary Islands where that volcano has just exploded last week nearby there. Um, and why is tellurium important? Tellurium is important for solar panels, cadmium telluride solar panels. So should we be looking at oceanic reserves? One of the areas where you've got a lot of high grade oceanic reserves is this region called the clarion Tipperton zone, which is between Hawaii and Mexico. And uh, you've got a lot of high grade metals there, which can be used for the green energy transition. The reason why this is attractive in some ways is because you've got nickel, manganese, copper, and cobalt, all of them in these very interesting deposits, which we call nodules, polymetallic nodules. And these are famously called potato-shaped um, entities, which are able to uh, be just picked up from the deep ocean and then processed. So they generate much less waste, uh, you have um, much less carbon footprint of the extraction process, but then there are biodiversity concerns in the deep sea. So you will hear about a lot of activism against deep sea mining currently, because we are now getting close to a point where we could have deep sea mining within the next 10 years and the activist community is all geared up to oppose it because their environmentalism is very much configured around opposition to certain kinds of developments, which is good to some degree, but sometimes they can also then not be very constructive in terms of coming up with solutions. And that's my concern is that we may end up with the same problem we did with nuclear power, that there was so much opposition and not science-based opposition, but uh, often conflag you know, conflagration of risk or what uh, Roger Casperson, the famous uh, geographer has called the social amplification of risk in his seminal work. Um, so we may have that here. So let's see where things go. But this is just to show you why this is important in terms of this pot potential area. So, uh, so one thing with reference to this is that there is a United Nations process to uh, regulate the mining of the deep sea. It's under the Law of the Sea Convention and there's an international seabed authority, which is based in Jamaica, that issues licenses for this kind of exploration. So there is a process that's more than 25 years old that has been put in place. And we had the first company listed on NASDAQ last week that is now looking into mining uh, the deep sea as well. So the issue then becomes, how careful should we be about where we choose to mine based on these various issues, you know, of risk in terms of environmental risk, social risk, and so on. And we have this notion of the precautionary principle, which in, in simple terms is like, better be safer than sorry. But again, given that we are living in a suboptimal set of circumstances, we cannot always afford to be infinitely cautious. And so 
that precautionary principle is not very helpful. It's not a science-based principle unless you unpack it. And you have different people who have tried to unpack it, like the International Union for Conservation of Nature. They issued guidelines um, in 2007 that required us to consider options, opportunity costs. And that's what we need to be doing more so. And um, so you should watch this space carefully in terms of how this plays out. We have various international treaties like the Convention on Biological Diversity that have also wrestled with this precautionary principle. Most recently, there was one on gene drive technologies. There was a campaign by environmentalists to, to not allow gene drive technologies. And the Convention on Biological Diversity voted against that moratorium campaign for the same reason that a precautionary principle cannot be laid out without opportunity costs. And you have to figure out the balance of the, the costs and the benefits. So what we are trying to do now in terms of um, moving forward is, and from a security perspective, what would interest you all perhaps is, we have the planetary boundaries concerns in terms of environmental impact and what can happen there. And we have the natural capital concerns on this side. So how do we make these decisions? So for example, if we have a deterioration of relations with China further, and we're just saying, you know, US needs to have secured supply, we have to think about is mining in the US or mining in the tropical rainforest in a country which may be friendly to the US like Brazil currently, is that a problem because of planetary boundaries? Uh, should we not be doing mining where it is most ecologically efficient because we are concerned about environmental security rather than using national security as a mechanism whereby we are trying to just make sure everything is in our control. And there is an argument to be made that in fact, greater interdependence promotes security. One of the things people have said, the reason why the situation hasn't even gone further south between US and China is because there is interdependence. And we do have a history of actually solving problems with critical metals with China. We had the rare earth crisis in 2011, where these technologies where we need a lot of these kinds of metals that China has dominance on, the US went to the World Trade Organization along with the European Union and Japan, and they were able to get China to uh, free supply of rare earths through the WTO process. So to, sometimes the security imperative is also conjured up, whereas it is not really something that is a serious matter. It can be resolved through existing mechanisms like the WTO, like a series of other mechanisms. Maybe we could have a separate minerals agreement. So I'll end there. Um, and these are just some links to our uh, work at uh, Delaware. And also we have this new online platform called Mineral Choices that Thomas is also helping tremendously with curating. So I would urge you to follow and see our work there. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Lee, for that. Um, I now wanna hand it over to Dr. Klinger for her presentation on global rare earth politics, persistent myths and possible pathways forward. Dr. Klinger, go ahead. All right, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Thomas, for organizing and uh, thanks to all of you for being here with us today. Um, it's always encouraging to me to see uh, how many folks want to come think about minerals and mineral security and mineral supply chains, uh, because indeed it is a challenge that we have to take on together. Um, okay, so I'll just go ahead and share my screen here. All right, and can I get a verbal confirmation that you're seeing my presentation yep. screen? Yep. All right, excellent. So as promised, uh, we're talking about some persistent myths and possible pathways forward. And uh, I designed this talk because um, if, you are go if you are curious about rare earth elements and you start with a uh, basic internet search, which is where most of us start when we're curious about something, you're likely to encounter a handful of persistent myths. Um, I would like to address those for you today so that you can navigate the debate uh, with a little bit more savvy and sophistication and hopefully be part of the kind of collaborative solutions uh, that Dr. Lee has just spoken of. 
Um, just a little bit of background. A lot of my research is found in my book, uh, Rare Earth Frontiers, which was based on five years of in-depth field work and mixed methods research in the US, uh, China, Brazil, and Germany. And one of the key findings is that as we have done it and are doing it now, in general, resource extraction is inseparable from the politics of sacrifice. That means some landscapes and some lives somewhere pay the price and bear the cost. But we can change this. And it's this conviction that is the basis of my policy work and current research to support more sustainable rare earth sourcing. Now, uh, this research is based on um, a global research agenda. It does also include outer space. I did not unfortunately have the chance to uh, travel to the moon to ask my questions, but this just gives you a sense of the kinds of places I either visited or examined uh, at, via interviews or archival research. This is a global challenge. And so I think that our research must also likewise be global. Uh, here's what you can expect in the talk today. I'll uh, cover the seven persistent myths, uh, talk through some of the challenges and implications that are presented by these myths um, in policy, security, uh, and science, and also put forth some ideas on possible steps to take, because I think we're past the point of wanting just to hear about the problems and the challenges. We know we are in a suboptimal situation and the challenges that we face are many. Um, and so I'm doing my part here to contribute some ideas to move the conversation forward. Uh, the first myth, and it bears, uh, this bears addressing until um, it is put to bed permanently, is that rare earths are in fact rare. Now in my research, I found the very first citation I found lamenting this misnomer is from a chemistry journal, an article published in 1907. Uh, but the fact that they are called rare uh, leads many of us to make the logical conclusion uh, that they are in fact scarce. And this then feeds some fairly dangerous assumptions, particularly given the geography of global rare earth production. These assumptions are to wit that China mines the most rare earth elements because China has the most, uh, which is not the case geologically speaking. Um, another related assumption is that rare earth elements are scarce, which means that they'll necessarily be subject to war and conflict. Um, related to that is an assumption that rare earths can only be obtained at a great cost, so great sacrifices are justifiable, and that they happen to be concentrated in emerging economies or developing uh, countries. And all of these are really a very potent trope in pop culture commentary and indeed uh, some policy as well. Now, uh, I believe many of us here have seen Avatar. You can see there's plenty of other examples where rare earths or things very much like them serve as a plot device um, in order to um, justify why someone is going to great lengths or perpetrating uh, grotesque violence in order to get a hold of these minerals. But here's the thing. So if we do believe that rare earths are rare, then that really shapes what we think our options are, right? Do we mine the moon, dig up the Amazon, charge into a war-torn region, take an East India company approach to Afghanistan, uh, destroy a biodiversity hotspot as in proposed in Madagascar, dig under the Greenland ice sheet or scrape up the ocean floor. When in fact, rare earth elements are not rare. Uh, this is a USGS map that shows some of the 800 plus known deposits throughout the world um, that have been documented. Um, and I'd like you to get a good look at the global spread of this because even though uh, rare earths and other critical materials are not rare, the historical geography of mining, right, our historical practices of mining, or maybe more recent histories of mining, shapes how we think about the future, even at the highest levels. So uh, this is a screenshot from uh, the Climate Smart Mining Report that was released by the World Bank in October 2019. And um, it's a really important mechanism for providing financing to uh, facilitate uh, meeting our demand for uh, critical materials. But I would like you to note the, uh, the way that the geography of critical materials is represented here, right? If we imagine these materials to be rare, 
Maybe that also then allows us to take a NIMBY approach, a not in my backyard approach to mineral resilience um, in particular. And to be fair, this is a stylized map. It's not meant to replace a USGS map, but nevertheless, I'd like you to note how no critical minerals appear to exist in global North countries. And this is underscored right, by the uh, comment or caption that many of these minerals will come from resource rich developing countries and emerging economies. And while this is the case, it does not accurately represent our geological reality, which again is that rare earth elements are not rare and that rare earth elements and other critical materials are actually abundant in destination markets as shown by this other US geological survey map, which shows them concentrated actually throughout the globe. Now, I'd like to issue though a crucial caveat for our current context, which is characterized by multiple unfolding climate crises. This is a map, um, this is a screenshot of an ongoing mapping project to document the extent of native or indigenous lands that are either traditional, recognized by treaty or other legal convention or are unseated. Um, it's important as we think about climate resilience that we move away from this mindset of presuming access to resources on indigenous lands in order to solve our climate problems, simply because mining on indigenous lands has shown to undermine climate mitigation and resilience goals. And wherever the case study takes place, this is the finding. And this may seem to present a conundrum given the overlapping geographies of indigenous lands and critical mineral deposits, but currently less than 1% of all rare earths and about 12% of all electronics that are consumed or used are actually recycled. So although recycling is not gonna help us meet all of our demand, uh, it's certainly, there's a lot of untapped potential there that we should be looking into. And so here's the first possibility, a step on our pathway forward. It, perhaps we should consider setting aside the rarity myth or the scarcity myth and its corollary, which is this far, far away imaginary that we have to go to great lengths to get these things when they are in fact in our own backyard in many different forms. We should in fact take a look, closer look at what's in our own backyards in terms of geological endowments, in terms of accumulating e-waste, and also critically looking at mine tailings. So these are the critical materials that are present in the waste from one mining operation or another. And actually, we don't even know uh, how much of these surface reserves we might have at our disposal. And so this represents, I think, a phenomenal uh, untapped potential for uh, meeting our critical materials needs, which could also help us reduce the overall waste footprint of legacy or existing mining sites. Now, uh, the second myth that you're likely to encounter if you uh, look into uh, rare earth politics is that red tape and environmental regulation ruined the rare earth industry in the West and handed it to China, right? So the assumption is that if only we had less regulation, the West would not have lost its rare earth industry. When in fact, if you look at the historical record, it's deregulation and disinvestment that were decisive factors in shifting industrial and innovative capacity to China. So um, particularly if you look at the uh, historical geography of uh, rare earth production, uh, you'll encounter many a chart like this, lovely one put together by the visual capitalist. And this conveys a story of China slowly or actually quite quickly from a mineral extraction uh, standpoint, uh, taking over uh, global rare earth production. And so we should look at what does it actually take to build a global monopoly over rare earth mining and processing? And this was a subject of in-depth research of mine while I was uh, living and researching this in China. So the short answer, and I won't take you through the whole history, is that if you wanna build a monopoly or, or just simply a robust supply chain, you need planning, investment, and crucially, international cooperation. Uh, building the rare earth capital of the world as uh, the largest rare, rare earth mine and industrial complex located in Inner Mongolia is now called, 
uh, this was a priority project in early cooperation between uh, the newly founded People's Republic of China in early 1950 and uh, the former Soviet Union. Um, but even that cooperation and that investment in building industrial infrastructure was not enough. It also took a global deregulatory revolution in order to transfer global production or production out of the West to China. And this emerged through a confluence of policies. I'm not alleging intention here, simply with the benefit of hindsight, we're able to see how a set of much broader decisions came together to shape the global industrial geography of rare earth mining and processing. So uh, Reagan, uh, Thatcher and Deng Xiaoping, uh, it, right around the same time period in late 70s, early 80s, uh, removed capital controls and restrictions on investment flows, which made it easier for industry to relocate uh, to places like China. And so following these reforms, uh, this really changed the terms of the game in terms of what constitutes a competitive enterprise. And so other countries had to choose, right, whether to remove capital controls, whether to invest or disinvest in competitive R&D, given the rapidly globalizing extractive and business landscape, or to remove regulations or incentives for cleaner production at home, right, in order to facilitate uh, the globalization of domestic industries. So uh, how you take a humble mining operation in 1959, which was uh, partially mechanized to a massive mining complex, which measures this blob here, seen in the satellite image, measures about 12 kilometers from end to end in 2012, uh, really depends on a confluence of factors, domestic uh, investment, international cooperation, and broader global policy changes. Um, but I think the key takeaway point here is this, is that as Western countries were opting out of rare earth mining and processing, China was opting in, scaling up investments, subsidies, and R&D as other countries were scaling down. Now, there's been all sorts of accusation of conspiracy, of um, planning, and things like this, and I can't find any evidence of that. I think we're able to analyze this with the benefit of hindsight. So this leads then to step two. Uh, smart re-regulation and reinvestment in domestic supply chain innovation and international collaboration uh, could help us uh, not necessarily decouple from China because that would um, that I think would be counterproductive in a number of respects, but simply to uh, selectively and strategically regionalize or re-regionalize our global supply chains. So the third myth. Um, is that rare earth mining and processing is somehow necessarily environmentally destructive. And of course, here is an image um, that I show whenever I give a talk about rare earth elements. This is a photo that I took uh, from the edge of uh, one of the tailings ponds in Bayan Ovo. Uh, it's not a black and white photograph. Um, and it just kind of gives you a sense of what happens uh, when environmental and social, socially responsible mining is not the priority. Uh, so the assumption, though, if this assumption that it's necessarily environmentally destructive, then we also assume that someone somewhere does have to bear the burden, that social and environmental safeguards are unrealistic, when actually what is destructive is the practice of mining with minimal regard for environmental protection or occupational health and safety that is destructive. Now, I agree with Dr. Ali that um, as far as I know, there is no free lunch in the universe, although I haven't seen very much of the universe, so it might exist somewhere. Um, but I think that it's not in an all or none situation. I think that there's a lot that we could do in terms of harm reduction to improve extractive practices. And indeed in different mining areas of China, you've seen this uh, unfold quite dramatically over the past five or six years. Um, I looked at the environmental impacts at the beginning of the decade after several decades of mining and processing in Baotou and Bayan Obo. And one of the things that you can see here is that around the, the heavy industrial facility, you have heavily contaminated soil. And because of the biogeophysical properties of the area, 
the contaminants over the past several decades have been leaching through the sandy subsoils through the agricultural area and into the Yellow River, which at this point is upstream of about 180 million people who depend on it for some form of water resource. It also, uh, and the related environmental contamination has resulted in a series of uh, devastating ailments such as skeletal fluorosis, uh, which affects the musculoskeletal system and livestock it manifests in long tooth disease, which makes it impossible to eat, which means that they starve to death and acute chronic arsenic toxicity, which damages skin and teeth and several major organ systems. Now I'll say this, and in the 21st century, that this is a preposterous price to pay for mineral security. Um, I'll go further and say that there's really nothing innovative about the wholesale destruction of landscapes and lives, even in the name of critical material security. And I think that we can avoid recreating this elsewhere while supporting China's ongoing cleanup efforts if we are willing to look squarely at the social and environmental costs of how we have done things. I did mention the ongoing cleanup efforts. Um, one of the things that I noted toward the end of my field work for the book uh, was that uh, environmental uh, regulatory officials uh, were reporting that uh, all of a sudden it seemed from one day to the next, uh, the fines that they were issuing to polluting industries were actually getting paid, right? That something had shifted uh, such that environmental regulation and, and inspection was becoming more of a priority. And uh, this has certainly been borne out in uh, reports in the intervening years. Uh, they've also, there was a, a very aggressive closure and consolidation campaign to close small scale and private mines and to consolidate them into state owned enterprises uh, with the intention again of controlling, uh, controlling potentially smaller offenders or more difficult to regulate actors in that space. So this then leads to uh, step three, which is that I think we can work together to make socially and environmentally superior mining and processing a standardized global practice. And it is worth pointing out that uh, collaboration is happening where it counts at the intergovernmental level via the International Standards Organization, um, where a couple dozen countries, including China and the US are engaged in writing sustainability standards uh, for the rare earth industry. Um, I'm proud to be a member of this effort. And also at the industry level, uh, through the Rare Earth Industry Association, they're working on developing uh, supply chain traceability and transparency mechanisms um, for industry specific actors. And again, partners in China and throughout the world are involved in this. Another really important uh, myth that I'd like to address, which you will no doubt encounter if you uh, go into researching rare earth elements is that uh, China embargoed rare earths in 2010. So the narrative is that the Chinese government ordered the embargo of rare earth shipments to Japan uh, in the context of a dispute over the Diaoyu or the Senkaku islands pictured here in the map. This has certainly been reinforced by media coverage and has since been treated as accepted fact. There is quite a bit more nuance to the story. So while it is true that shipments were disrupted from at least one port in eastern China and about a third of Japan's ports did report a disruption for a six to eight week period, this was not a calculated move by the central government, but rather local initiative of people on China's eastern seaboard was absolutely key. Um, and so words do actually matter. Um, an embargo is an official act that is undertaken during a time of war. And so although there was, yes, a disruption because uh, local people took matters into their own hands in the context of a larger geopolitical dispute, uh, calling it an embargo imbues it with greater power and calculation than I think was actually on display. But yet we've seen these headlines, the same alarmist headlines for over a decade about how China, uh, China's control over rare earths is somehow directed uh, directly toward the United States, right? And they're charged with this geopolitical rhetoric that would have us believe that this will be the next cause of war any day now. And we have also uh, seen this uh, alarmism 
in plenty of fictional contexts, which I think does help uh, reinforce this narrative. Uh, Call of Duty Black Ops 2 used this as a plot device um, in what was then their highest grossing video game release. Um, Rare Earths have featured as a plot device in House of Cards and Archer and in many novels released in the past decade. And so for those of us who don't know any better, uh, these serve as a kind of information that tells us how to think about this uh, potential security issue in terms that I would say are not entirely constructive. And so this leads to step four. Uh, I think that we can de-escalate alarmism in the West. And I would say that rare earths can be exciting enough without invoking the China threat or fantasizing about World War III. All right, so the fifth myth is that uh, the solution to uh, these security challenges posed by China's dominance of the rare earth sector is to open more mines outside of China, right? In ever more remote places. So the assumption here is that the problem is that China controls most rare earth mining. When in fact, China is now a net importer of rare earth ores. China became a net importer of rare earths in 2018 for the first time since 1985 as part of a broader strategy to reduce domestic mining output, to clean up uh, contaminated sites, to import from new mines that were opening overseas, and to emphasize value added processing and increase R&D in technological applications and to enhance the profile of high-tech exports. Now, what this means then is that we could open hundreds of new mines, but without investing in value added processing and midstream suppliers, we would still be dependent on China. So this leads to step five, which is that we can invest and should invest in R&D, in value added processing, in e-waste recycling and mine reclamation in the Americas, right? The alternative is that we become China's primary source for raw materials. And this, of course, you know, trade 101, uh, this would uh, intensify uh, the trade deficit and would continue in import dependence for value added goods. Um, moving right along here to uh, the sixth myth, which, which is very closely related, is that the world is dependent on China for rare earth elements specifically. Uh, but the assumption here then is that if China cuts off rare earth exports again, the rest of the world will be unable to build its necessary technologies, when actually it's not rare earth elements per se, but rather rare earth bearing technological components that are manufactured in and exported by China that are actually quite critical uh, to many of our energy security and other uh, economic applications. But the important point here is that it's not, the supply chains don't just flow run one way, right? China is also a very important destination market for rare earth bearing finished products that are produced in the West, like automobiles, for example. And so our economies really and truly are interdependent. And so this leads to step six on our possible pathway, pathway forward, which is to recognize that any meaningful solution involves counterparts in China and we're not starting from zero here. We're simply building on decades of bilateral scientific cooperation and economic integration between the US and China, which are the most interdependent economies in terms of scale and scope in the history of the world. So we already have a pretty strong foundation here. Uh, the seventh myth is that renewable energy technology is the primary driver of increased demand for rare earth elements. Now it is certainly a factor, right? And I'm gonna put this image up here again uh, to draw your attention to the wind turbines uh, in the distance as a kind of note of maybe the kind of future that we don't, don't want to build. We don't want to have our renewable energy build out at the expense of landscapes and livelihoods around the world. But this is a little too simplistic of a representation. The prevailing assumption that, that is informed by this myth is that renewable energy technology uses a lot of rare earth elements. And so therefore, quote, green energy has a dirty little secret. And we've seen this repeated in headlines all over the place. Now, some of these are advanced in good faith, right? We want to make sure that our green energy isn't built 
on social and environmental destruction. But plenty of these are also advanced in bad faith in order to slow down the renewable energy transition that we critically need to be accelerating. But here's the key point. Every major form of energy generation, whether it's nuclear, fossil, big hydropower, and renewable, relies to some extent on rare earth elements. In fact, one of the primary applications for rare earth elements imported into the United States is for petroleum refining. Uh, this is an important demonstration of just how important they are. So I would say this, just to wrap up, that our real dirty little secret here is maybe it's the status quo, right? Which consists of digging a big hole somewhere new, creating a massive waste footprint, and then building a trash mountain of our discarded electronics and products, but not in our backyard. Now here's our ticket out of this status quo. It's the simple fact that rare earth elements are not destroyed in this process. Uh, they are not like fossil fuels in that they're combusted and released into the atmosphere when we're done. Of course, we do have uh, real challenges in strategic reclamation and the energy demands and that sort of thing, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try. And so that leads us then to step seven, which is that we should really work on closing the loop in the rare earth supply chain by investing in recycling and mine reclamation, and also mandating design specifications that feed a circular economy, that actually make it possible uh, to make recycling and reclamation more feasible. In other words, we can seize the low hanging fruit. This is an image of discarded cell phones. And I'll close with just a couple of ideas on what we do to achieve critical mineral sustainability and security. The first is to reimagine our future, to engage with frontline communities, to collaboratively envision our, and design our pathway forward. This is critical for avoiding the kind of domestic and local security concerns that Dr. Lee mentioned. We do need in this country to dare to think beyond the election cycle while addressing the livelihood needs of the present, and also to connect with established institutions and community organizers in prospective mining, manufacturing, and recycling sites to make sure that everyone's on board for whatever we decide to do. Uh, of course, we do need to recycle. I did mention that currently less than 1% of all rare earths and 12% of all electronics that are consumed are recycled. And unfortunately, important achievements by EU, US, Japanese, and I should also add Chinese researchers have not yet been scaled up to unlock new and sustainable sources of rare earths and other critical materials, largely because of the design and the logistical and energy challenges. We should also selectively repatriate our supply chains to rebuild industrial and research capacity on a regional scale in the Americas and to invest in the entire supply chain, not just the first stages in order to revive and stimulate innovative R&D to develop programs to pilot and deploy innovations at a national and regional scale. And we should stop exporting e-waste because it is actually and could be a tremendous resource. And all of this requires though, that we appropriately legislate, that we create a regulatory environment that rewards upstream firms for socially and environmentally responsible mining and processing, that we provide tax incentives for downstream firms to purchase certified clean rare earth elements and that we work at the local, state, federal, and regional levels to create multiple clean, high-tech, and fun functionally renewable rare earth supply chains. You know, uh, the, the road ahead of us is long, but it is important. It is an important and good road to walk. So thank you very much for your time and attention. I look forward to your questions and discussion. All right. Well, thank you both very much for those great presentations. We actually do have one question. If you have any questions, please submit them now so we can answer them. But we do have a question from Aaron. This can go to both of you, but um, Dr. Klinger first here. Uh, what is the mood among U.S. counterparts in China? Do they recognize the need or want to build REE solutions with the U.S.? Uh, the short answer is yes, um, in terms of wanting to build collaborative solutions. Um, and this is why, uh, why initiatives such as those at the International Standards Organization, which was in fact initiated by China, uh, have been moving forward for the past several years. Um, so yeah, the, the will is there on both sides. We just need to be able to see through the geopolitical bluster. I have a 
question for Dr. Ali and in, in, in kind of some of the programs, especially at the Elliott School and the program that I focus in is conflict resolution. Can you talk a little bit about the need for international affairs practitioners to have the kind of environmental conflict resolution skills and some of these critical issues in the future? Like, should we be teaching that to our students of how to work with indigenous communities, work with local populations when it comes to the need for increased extractives or mining operations? Yes, I think, um, you know, the the way in which like the School of Foreign Service uh, and some of the other international affairs schools are, are currently structured in the US, uh, there, there's more environmental curriculum being added, but it's usually done as a kind of um, a side dish, <laughs> you know, so there isn't there isn't the, 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 that's where the systems approach is important. By a systems approach, I mean, you are looking at the interconnections between all of the different parts of planetary processes, which include uh, the natural processes, social processes, political processes, um, and not just saying this is something that's done by one department and, um, and that is not done as much. So a lot of times the environmental coursework is elective. It's not required. And so in fact, you know, the people who are uh, taking the environmental coursework are often the ones who are going to work for NGOs and they're not as, you know, geared towards the, the leading light careers in the State Department. Uh, and that's unfortunate. I hope that changes. Uh, so, uh, and that will require signaling from the employers to some degree. We saw that in the business community, the employers started sending those signals. But um, uh, I, I think um, this is an important uh, diagnosis that you have there, Tom, that we do not have that same uh, level of importance given to these issues. We do have a question in the chat from Allison, which says, uh, what emerging technologies are you both excited about to improve mining and recycling? Is there any examples or technologies that you can think of or projects possibly? Uh, yeah, well, there's a number, there's a number of projects that, um, that I could talk about at length. And I would say, rather than describe those, I think given, given our limited time and what have you, I, I want to say that I think actually where a lot of the critical work needs to happen is we're is building out the social and logistical infrastructure in order to scale up the innovations that have been developed in the past decade. Uh, currently, we have brilliant scientists working at our national laboratories and in research universities around the country and around the world that have developed techniques to make recycling uh, scalable and less chemical and energy intensive. But they're just the missing piece is how you actually apply these on a larger scale. And so that is a that's a policy challenge, uh, which I would encourage folks in this audience to take up. Yeah, absolutely. There's a couple of other questions which we can try to address. Yeah. There's one on AUKUS. Um, and, you know, as a citizen of Australia and the US, I'm really appalled by the, especially what the Australian government is doing with reference to uh, all this grandstanding uh, with reference to marginalizing uh, some of their interests in the Asia Pacific region at the behest of forming this inviolable alliance with the US and uh, UK. So the AUKUS point much is uh, we want everyone to get along. We want Australia to get along with the US and UK they do not have to do this in a way which is acrimonious, which is slighting the French, which is slighting China. Uh, they have done this before they did it with the Quad. There, so the, I mean, it's confusing. You have AUKUS, you have the Quad. Uh, the Quad is India, China, uh, US and Australia. And now you have this AUKUS business. So it's, it's, not, it's a distraction in my view. And it's a reflection of the military industrial complex winning out. There is, there's no, I mean, there's 70, $80 billion submarine deal and all, you know, China is not going to attack Australia with nuclear submarines. I mean, the absurdity of it all, it is simply a junket for the military industrial complex. And this is something President Eisenhower wa warned us about. You know, now you have an Eisenhower memorial 
in Washington, the newest of the memorials, I would urge your group to visit the Eisenhower Memorial, which is right in front of the US Department of Education now. Uh, read his quotations. He was a military general and he warned us of this. And this is exactly what we're doing and this AUKUS is a, a reflection of that. So thank you for asking that, whoever asked it. Um, do you have, yes, do you have any thoughts about domestic mineral chain, supply chain investment? So yes, uh, Julie, would you like to take that? Um, I'll say very quickly, um, yes, I, I am encouraged that we're actually seeing uh, grant programs being seriously floated. Uh, one of the things we saw at the beginning of the decade uh, was just a succession of failed legislative approaches to uh, somehow support the reconstruction of our rare earth supply chain uh, within the US. And a number of those were, uh, were voted down simply because they actually provided some modicum of support to help domestic industries get up and off the ground. And so, you know, with the with the incentives programs currently under discussion, uh, such as, you know, offering incentives for using uh, uh, recycled sources and things like this, I think it's very encouraging. Uh, Salim? Uh, yes, I think uh, I agree as well. Uh, overall, um, with reference to um, uh, what, what, what I'm trying to make sure I get the right question. This one, which one? What, this was. Um, this was the. Do you have any thoughts about the domestic mineral supply? Yeah, the domestic one. Yes, sorry. Yes, uh, the domestic supply. You know, I think we should be investing in those areas which are ecologically efficient and economically efficient to mine. And going back to what Julie was saying about. We have these deposits here. The places where I think there is a potential is Alaska, uh, where there are some areas, not all. We don't want them near the pebble mine where the, you had the you know, salmon fisheries of Bristol Bay, but there are many other parts of Alaska where there is potential. Um, but uh, this goes back to the NIMBY problem. And you know, our environmentalist friends, if they really want environmental justice, which they keep asking for, then they need to be able to allow some of those projects to happen in northern countries where we have the ability to regulate and more so. So, I, you know, that's what my concern is. Um, if So ideally, yes, we want to improve production. We want to recycle. We want to get the metals out of tailings. We want to do phyto mining. We want to do in-situ leaching, all those win-wins. As much as we can get the free lunch, <laughs> we try, but it will not be completely free thermodynamically. It can never be completely free because you will have to inject some energy and you will have to have some cost. But at the same time, it's, there, there is still much more you can squeeze out of those. But there will be for some metals where we will need to. Now in the US, we are doing that with lithium. We are doing that with Rio Tinto has just started the project around lithium. Um, so that is, there, but I, I think there's a lot of nimbyism in the US still, and it's largely fueled by billionaire environmentalists. You should read this book by a Yale professor called Billionaire Wilderness, just published by uh, Princeton University Press. And it tells you the story of these people with their Montana ranches and Alaska ranches and whatnot. And they don't give a damn about the developing world. They just want to feel good about that they are very green and all in their own patches, which is their their domain, like the ancient fiefdoms of Scotland, where they say we have the forest and we have. So there's a lot of this, unfortunately, which is happening from the ultra elite environmentalists in, in the US. Um, one last question before we end. Uh, thank you, Dr. Klinger, for responding. To, that's our department head, Dr. Sotomayor. So thank you. Um, uh, Madison says, how do developing countries get the money to invest in mining for RE sustainability? Does China's BRI project provide any funding for this or where do they get the money from? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So uh, yes, um, the short answer is that uh, under the banner of the BRI, uh, there's been a number of investments, particularly in Central Asian um, and Sub-Saharan African countries uh, in geo from everything from basic geological science to uh, actual mining concessions. Uh, the other mechanism uh, I do want to mention is uh, the World Bank Climate Smart Mining uh, mm -hmm. Initiative, right? So there are a number of these mechanisms currently being developed 
And um, I do think that that is uh, a policy and discussion area that we do need to expand on further. Because to the point about um, uh, making sure that this proceeds in a globally just way, we do need to make sure that uh, meeting our critical materials needs doesn't necessarily involve uh, the familiar sort of debt driven development pathways of the late, latter 20th century uh, that might force developing countries to pay for decades for uh, supplying uh, global north countries uh, yeah. uh, with their mineral supply needs. All right. Yeah, absolutely. There, there is a greening of the BRI that is happening. You know, China just announced that they are not going to fund coal-fired power plants in the BRI. Uh, in Pakistan, uh, which is one of the largest recipients of the BRI funds through the CPEC initiative, they have decided to cancel a lot of the coal-powered projects. So that is happening, but um, they should be investing more in these kind of green tech uh, minerals where if there are uh, opportunities. And a lot, this is where the Afghanistan situation is going to be very interesting to follow because, um, you know, China is um, going to continue to play a role in Afghanistan and they do have a lot of um, unrealized mineral deposits. It's not as much as some of the news headlines from few years where they put $3 trillion on the Afghan rare earths and minerals, which is, you know, to, to, a bit misleading at many levels. Our USGS friends will tell you that, but still, Afghanistan has a lot of potential which has not been realized in terms of minerals, and it could be used to develop the country. It, it doesn't have to be all mined in a dirty way. There are very responsible ways to get to some of those deposits. So that should be a way to help the country. I mean, what else are they going? Then you're not going to get big tourist droves coming to Afghanistan. You have to find ways to develop the country. And this is what frustrates me: is that you have opposition on every level. You can't, you know, you you cannot have development occur out of uh, of out of thin air. You have to make investments in primary resources. We don't want an opium economy there again either, right? So you can't have opium, you can't have tourism. So you want to have something and primary industries like minerals are an important part of it. There's actually a, um, and we'll end it here, but there is a capstone project being done. I heard about the other day, which is a year long project we do here at the Elliott School. And one of the groups will be working on China's interest in Afghanistan. And so of course I will be talking to them about the, the mineral resources there because it's definitely an important topic. Um, but thank you both very much for coming out today and engaging with us in this first session. Um, we hope to see you later on with the networking series at the end of this year. And again, thank you to everyone who joined us and for those watching online. Um, and we will see you on the next session. Take care. Everyone. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you. Take care.